So, good evening everyone and welcome to the Cinema of the German Film Museum and to our lecture and film series dedicated to the work of Chantal Ackermann. Very happy to see that so many of you came. Um, the lecture tonight will be given by Shin Steinberg that uh, um, came all the way over from uh, Tel Aviv. I'm very happy that he made it and that he made it to the lecture. And we're going to see the film Toute une nuit from Chantal Ackermann. Um, I don't want to say long, I just wanted to um, point out that we, as you know, we also have a couple of screenings outside of the usual lecture um, dates that we have in our um, program, which all of you probably already have. Um, and we have these accompanying programs. Um, in this case, this Saturday, 26th of January at 6 p.m., we're going to screen the film Zut again. The one. So for those who missed it last week, you have a chance to see it on Saturday. The lecture by Tim Griffin is also already online on our YouTube channel. Channel. So, in case you missed it last week, you can watch the YouTube lecture, then come over here, watch the film, and um, yeah, you can have almost everything. You just won't be able to participate and ask questions. So, uh, but that you can do tonight. Uh, so, I hope a lot of you will stay after the film. We'll have after the lecture a short break, then the screening, and after the film, you have the chance to ask questions. So, I hope a lot of you will stay and uh, participate. Um, yeah, like I said, I don't want to talk too much. You can check out all of our program on our website um, of the Film Museum and also the program website, um, Chantal, um, it's Ackermann.de. You can um, check it all over there. And I'll ask Vincent Rediger to now present our guest of the evening. Thank you very much. Yes, I'll, I'll be very, very brief. Um, in 1989, uh, Matthias Müller, a German filmmaker, made a film uh, called Home Stories, which is a compilation film, and it's composed uh, only of excerpts from classical Hollywood films, mainly melodramas, and it mostly shows uh, moments of longing and anxious anticipation, uh, but it doesn't develop a narrative at all. And um, that film uh, really became a festival favorite, and it's been a reference for, for a long, long time. Um, but it is, in a way, the, the idea of that film is very similar, but we can probably also discuss the differences, um, to the idea that Chantal Ackermann explored in the film that you are going to see tonight and that Jen, uh, Jen Scheinberg is going to introduce uh, to you tonight. Um, it's a film that it has the normal length of a fiction film, 80 minutes. Um, some of the characters reappear. Uh, there's actually one narrative arc of a woman leaving her husband. But then at the end of the film, she returns just in time before the alarm clock goes off so he doesn't really know that she ever left him. Um, but other than that, it's, a, as you will see, um, a, a series of moments of longing, of transition thresholds mo moments. Uh, uh, and it is, in that sense, a feature film that is also profoundly experimental and the profound uh, meditation on probably what is the core of, of the film melodrama. Um, our guest tonight, Jens Scheinberg, approaches this film from the point of view of both a theorist and critic, a curator, and a filmmaker. Um, Jens Scheinberg uh, is a documentary and experimental filmmaker who has been uh, working in these fields uh, for many years. His work has been exhibited both at film festivals and in uh, gallery and art contexts. He has had uh, exhibitions at the Whitechapel Gallery in London, for instance. But he's also, and this brings us to his connection to Germany, a regular at the Oberhausen uh, Film Festival, which, by the way, on the way here, uh, had a conversation with another colleague where we brought this up. Um, this museum exists because the guy who invented the Oberhausen Film Festival was hired by the city of Frankfurt as the culture commissioner in 1970. And he devised this whole slate of museums along the riverbank. And this is actually one of the first film museums in the proper sense uh, to exist anywhere, uh, certainly in Europe. Um, so there's the Oberhausen connection. And I'm bringing this up because it's actually your first visit to Frankfurt tonight. And we're very happy 
that you're here and um, Laura sort of hinted at it. Um, it's very brave of you to come because um, you were actually down with fever this afternoon. But uh, this is the pool of Chantal Ackermann. You can't, you can't give up on her. <laughs> yes. Please welcome together with me, Sam Sandberg. So, um, good evening. Uh, thank you for your words, Vincent. Uh, it's very important for me uh, to be here tonight uh, in this season about uh, Chantal Ackerman. Uh, I would like to start with some personal words. Uh, Chantal Ackerman's uh, death in uh, 2015 was particularly difficult since she was a filmmaker who most influenced and whose films had a great uh, impact on me. Therefore, on the first uh, anniversary of her death, I initiated a memorial evening at the Tel Aviv Cinematheque. Chantal Ackerman's sister, Sylviane Ackerman, attended this uh, screening, as well also her cousin, the writer Esther Horner, who lives in Tel Aviv. It was a full house and a very exciting evening, uh, full of love for Chantal. And now to the film we will be watching, <coughs> we'll be watching tonight. Uh, Two on We, in English, All Night Long, from 1982, is Chantal Ackermann's first feature in the 1980s. The film takes place in Brussels, although the actual name is not mentioned throughout. It is a non-narrative, a non-linear film, fractured and fragmented, in its form, composed of dozens of vignettes staged in Tableau Vivant, Tableau Vivant, with 70 characters interacting over one night, waiting, embracing, dancing, leaving. This is indeed an extensive number of participants. And unlike multi multiple characters' films like Shortcuts by Robert Altman, the couples or the individual in each vignette don't intersect, except the woman, one story of the woman that uh, Vincent was talking about. The connection between the vignettes uh, is a connection of space and time, the city of Brussels at nighttime. Ackerman doesn't provide us with any background information about each of the characters and doesn't explain the, their behavior or their psychological motivation. Instead, she sketches a moment with its plenitude of details. Most of the time, the interaction and communication are not delivered through words, but rather through the body gestures of the inhabitants. In this lecture, we'll focus on these themes. The film bears a resemblance to the City Symphony, a genre, documentary, documentary avant-garde films that emerged in the 1920s during the silent era and depicted, depicted the daily life of the modern city, exploring its rhythm and the movements of people from morning to night. The most famous of these was Berlin Symphony, Symphony of a Great City by Walter Ruttmann from 1927. And the name Symphony is not coincident, coincidental, as the films were based on uh, musical principles rather than on those of narrative. The Symphony films were the first documentaries, and they established the connection between documentary and the avant-garde film. As they were not based on plot or dramatic principles, but were instead poetic, experimental films. It is interesting to note because uh, Ackerman's documentaries, for example, from the East or from the other side or Sud, are also experimental documentaries. Two on We, though, is not a documentary, but it is a film that depicts the interaction of a group of people in the city through their body gestures and movements between late evening till morning. It's a symphony of many bodies, choreographed in a very accurate way 
and can thus be described as city choreography. There is also something in the film remin reminiscent of a musical composition created by the sound of steps, especially heels, a natural sound, and by a musical structure of variation on theme. However, un unlike the 1920s city symphonies, it's a very intimate film whose cast consists mainly of Ackerman's friends and family, including her mother. It deals not only with rhythm, but with emotions and the yearning for love and human contact in the city. In his pioneering essay from 1903, The Metropolis and Mental Life, Georg Zimmel writes about the influence of urban life on the, on the individual. He claims that men's struggle for a physical existence in the city is turned over to a psychological struggle for survival. The metropolis pressures its inhibitant through the increased types of stimuli it produces that require its response. Therefore, the psychological conditions created by the city are such that deep emotional relationship, relationship are impossible. This form of being is evident, evident in two on we, and we can see and feel it. And please note, uh, notice, pay attention to the relationship of the architecture in the city to the relationship between the characters. It is very important to stress that the city of Brussels is the place where Ackerman was born and made her first film, Sout Ma Ville, I Blow Up My Town, a place she left at 1970 when she moved to New York. And of course, it is a place where Jean Dilman takes place. But although she was a nomad filmmaker and felt displaced all of her life, Brussels was still very important to her since it was a mother city. As her mother lived in Brussels, Chantal Ackerman was deeply connected to her mother in a very symbiotic way, as can be seen in many of her films, and in the most straightforward way in her last film, No Home Movie, 2015, most of which occurs in her mother's apartment in Brussels during the last days of her life. But his, as the title suggests, even there she does not feel at home. In Cinema 2, the time image, Gilles Deleuze distinguishes between the cinema of the action and the cinema of the body. An observation that has been quite influential in contemporary discussions of film performance and film theory. Deleuze discusses the cinema of the body as a type of cinema which privileges gestures, gestures, postures, and attitudes over concrete character and plot development. His key contention is that the cinema of the body is performative. That is, it cannot be simply understood as a reproduction of a script. Performativity describes a passage, the passage from text-bound theater to performance art, as it replaces narrative Casuality. The less definition of the cinema of the body, therefore, centers on Bertolt Brecht's concept of the gestus and the film practice of John, Cas John Cassavetes. Brecht's concept of the gestus refers to a physical acting style which opposes the cliché dramatic one, according to which the actor becomes the character he or she embodies. He includes Chantal Ackerman's cinema in the cinema of the body and writes that starting with Jean Dilman, Chantal Ackerman wants to show gestures in their fullness. Chantal Ackerman's novelty, says Deleuze, lies in showing in this way bodily attitudes as a sign of states of body particular to the female character. In Two and We, we, we see not only female characters, but those of men as well. The duration is not as it played out in Jean Dilman, though some shots are quite long compared to mainstream cinema. 
It is the gestures, however, that play a central role in the film and allow the body to speak through them. Ackerman uses these in a performative way and does not re rely on realistic dramatic acting style. As she examines, examines the emotional aspect of the movements of her characters. In this respect, the similarity between the words emotion, emotion and motion is very interesting. Seeing that the etymology of the word, of the word motion comes from the Latin word motionem, which means a moving emotion and emotion. The same duality can be found in the verb move, to move, which means to move physically. I moved the chair, for example, but also in the emotional sense. I was moved by this music in the meaning of I was touched by this music. And indeed, when, the, when we see a film that excites us, we say it moved me. But first, I would like to examine the cinematic form of the first shots of the film, since these are the shots that usually establish its filmic language. In these shots, Ackerman shows a multiplicity of characters moving through dark spaces. The titles appear on a blue background, accompanied by dark, threatening, non-diegetic music, music. The first shot is a long shot of the city after twilight, with a church scene in the background. Cars cross the frame, while on the left side of the frame, a couple is walking in what is a static shot throughout. The street sounds, which will become very dominant, can be heard on the soundtrack and an Italian love song, L'amore eh, perdonare, translated Love Forgive, by Gino Lorenzi, and the nickname of Gerard Berliner, which will be played repeatedly in several scenes on the film, becoming a musical leitmotif, blurring the distinction between diegetic and non-diegetic. It's a meta-diegetic sound that floats all over the city. Ackerman established the notion of the city and the couples that will play a major role in the film. The, the, the transition between the dark sound of the title and the kitsch of the love song creates kind of a dissonance and establishes two different moods that the film uh, will oscillate between them, the dark and lonely and the lo longing for love. But it's also very important to pay close attention to the tr translation of the Italian words of Lorenzi's song. Although they contain love cliches, in the, context, in the context of the film, they also bear a very sad and morbid aspect of love. These words trans translate as such. Do you know, love will forgive. Now you are here, but why have you gone? Do you know, love will forgive. This wound. For me, life, life has no sense anymore. The last love. And if you don't love, then you have to leave. I won't be able to start again anymore. This mood will echo itself in the second song I will discuss. In the second shot, we see a sidewalk with a high fence and the woman seen in long shot, walking and crossing the frame. It's a static shot and the composition of the frame is made of, up of diagonals. The sound in the street noise and also the sound of her heels, a sound which will be very dominant of the, in the film, the sound of heels. In the background, we hear the threatening music of the title sequence. In the third shot, we see a man walking and descending the stairs to the subway. The shape of the entrance is circular and arched. It's, not a, it's a static shot. At the end of the shot, we hear the faint sound of the Italian song from the first shot. The editing between this shot and the previous one connects and creates a continuity between the two, even though they are in two different spaces. This kind of editing will appear throughout the film. 
And it may be a confusing one because Ackerman connects the movement of bodies in different spaces against the main principle of the classical continuity editing, which was based on the unity of space and time. By adopting this kind of editing in an oppositional way, the filmmaker creates a semantic connection between the separate characters and emphasizes what is similar between them, loneliness in the city. In the fourth shot, we see a crossroads with a bus in the background. A man enters the frame running, almost missing it, but finally catches up the bus. The fifth shot has the camera located on a moving car, tracking backwards, and we can see a single car driving on the highway. The camera then zooms in to the car and we see a child sleeping, laying his head on the woman who is driving. In the soundtrack, we hear the traffic together with the song heard in the previous shots. The sixth shot is the first interior shots shot. A long shot of a woman dressed in red, walking restless across the room. Then it's the actress, uh, then uh, moving towards the camera and going off screen while the camera remains static, St staring at the room. After a while, the woman returns to the frame, sits on the couch, uh, leaving the frame again and going outside the room. Again, the camera doesn't follow her and keeps staring at the empty room. Uh, after several seconds, the woman returns to the frame. We hear her heels, the off-screen street sound and Arabic music heard from the street. As in Jean Dilman, the use of off-screen space is common in the film. And as a result, there is an unusual emphasis on the space devoid of people that becomes an integral part of the character and the gaze of the film. This is usually described as an empty space, but it is not empty at all, as we can contemplate uh, on the furniture in the room, which is minimalistic, a red couch in an open window, which will be visual motive, a visual motive throughout the film. Appearing repeatedly in many Ackermann's films, the repetitiveness of the movement foreshadows the movements in the film. And it also one of the, uh, one of the character characteristics of Ackerman cinema. Almost all of the film is composed of static shots. And Ackerman uses it to, to create a distinctive space unit they trap the different characters. They enter the frame and they leave it, but they also always return. The static shots, and as a result of them, the off-screen space make us aware of the cinematic frame. The next shot is a cut to a medium shot of the woman dialing the phone. A man answers, hello. She hung up. She hung up the phone and says to herself the first words of the film, I love him. She exits the frame. This is the first sentence in the film and it comes instead of the familiar, I love you. This is the way Ackerman establishes the alienated relationship between the couples. They cannot say this sentence face to face, only the opposite. If they feel love or desire, they can only expre express it through body gestures, through nonverbal language. In this sense, uh, sorry, in this scene, there is also a reference to a common scene in the melodrama genre, a woman waiting for a phone call. It is important to say that this is not a pastiche, but an exp expansion of this familiar scene by showing the nervous waiting in its fullness, focusing in a very detailed way on the body gestures and body language. This waiting scene will become one of the film's recurring, uh, recurring scenes and part of its seriality. We'll see other women and men waiting alone in the room 
or outdoors in all the possibilities. The film is structured or, uh, sorry, the film is structured around repetition and seriality. Ackerman was influenced by the American avant-garde cinema, especially the structuralist filmmaker of Michael Snow, and also by the cinema of Andy Warhol of Andy Warhol. Needless to say, seriality plays a major role in his art and films. And I will also, of course, mention uh, Jonas Mekas, uh, rest in peace, which died yesterday. Uh, there are several series in Tu on We. One of them is a scene with a fixed structure. We see a woman and a man, they move fast towards each other and embrace very dramatically after they have not seen one another for a long time or when they feel attraction. Although it is an artificial movement, there is a lot of emotion in it, but there is also something violent, like a collision. The hugging becomes a grasping. The embracing is acted in a, perf in a performative way, a point to which I referred at the beginning of the lecture. Thus Ackerman creates a complex movement that combines deep longing and violence between these characters as they cannot bear the solitude. It seems like they are embracing each other for the last time. In one of the most beautiful scenes in the film, we see this pattern that combines performativity, humor, desire, and couple dance, which will be repeated in various forms throughout the film. We see men and women, two strangers, seated in front of the table inside a pub as they both look, look to the left. The atmosphere, colors, and, light, and lighting remind us of the paintings of Edward Hopper, which also depicted the alienation of the urban space. The woman has a very subtle smile and almost looks at him. Then he drinks the beer and she lifts her glass right after him. They both look to the same direction. She turns her head hesitantly, aiming to look at him. He raises his beer so he returns her sight to the other side. And lifts her glass too. Then he turns his head towards her. She turns her head and looks at him. He opens his wallet to pay, and then she opens her purse to pay. He gets up from the table and walks out the frame. She also gets up and stands alone in the frame. The gestures are choreographed, choreographed in a very precise and synchronous manner. If they were delayed mirror images of each other, the movements are very shy and gentle. Then he returns, moves slowly towards her, and suddenly she pounces on him, throwing herself and embracing him. As they hug in a very dramatic way, like they know each other, like they know each other in what seems like a very desperate need for contact. Ackerman analyzes this the movement and dissects it into small micro motions and show us the in between gestures, gestures that the eye cannot see. As the proto cinema pioneer Edward Maybridge used the camera to the study of human and animal motion and dissected their movements into small details, exposing the invisible. The gestures are, are fragmented, much in the same way of the fragmented form of the film's narrative. After this scene, we see the couple dancing alone near the bar in a long take, in a very stylized and dramatic way, holding each other in a very tight way and moving their head from side to side in an exaggerated motion. Ackerman takes, an act of, takes the act of dance, which seems familiar, and depicts it in a totally different manner creating a defamiliarization full of ambiguity, which, make it, which makes it so poetic. 
The couple perform the dance when we can feel the physicality of their movements. <coughs> They dance heavily, grasping each other tightly. They move as though they were connected and tied to each other, completely inseparable. inseparable. In, in contrast to the gentle way they looked at each other, the physical contact is almost violent. There is a big difference between the first eye contact, which was very subtle and enchanting, to this eerie struggle. Their bodies speak a double language, a mixture of aggressiveness, sensitivity, mechanicalness, sexuality, and deep yearning. The movement evokes in a certain way the dance of Pina Bausch and the way men and women interact in her work. And it, is, and it is very interesting that Ackerman's next film will be the documentary film about Bausch, One Day Pina Asked, <coughs> made one year later in 1983. These two artists share their contemplation on everyday life and repetition. And in several senses, scenes, sorry, in the documentary, they are also... <clears throat> there are also crashes and collisions between men and women. <clears throat> I would like to show you one of the scenes from this documentary made for television, considered to be one of the best documentaries, documentaries made, <clears throat> made on dance. Okay. So let's see it. Uh, there is a similarity as you will see in the film tonight, but Ackermann's approach it more soft and sensitive. In some ways, this scene also reminds, reminds us of the sex scene in the end of Je Tui Lele, 1974, <coughs> which is also uh, choreographed in a mixture of tenderness and violence. I will now return to the dance scene in Tu and We. The violent gestures in the dance that are, uh, that are accompanied by a uh, diegetic French chanson song, Ma Reverence, from 1979 by the famous French singer and musician Veronique Sanson. The words are as follows and, the, and are again very important and in most of the um, film copies are not translated, but they are very important. When I won't have more time, sings um, Veronique Sanson, to find the courage all time, like I was 20 years old, to see that everything was a mirage. I'm retiring, my bow, my bow. When my son will grow and he won't need me anymore. When the people who love me will be taken away from me, I'm retiring from them. My bow. And my life slowly fall asleep. My heart would be cold. He will not know how, how to uh, go crazy anymore. My heart. And it would be like the poor clock that requires repair. There will be no more flame. There will be no more flame. There will be, there will be no, no more women. And my loyal friends will disappear one by one. And they found that she was beautiful. That I had actually done my best. Then I'll be ashamed of my hands. I'll be ashamed of my hands. When I won't have more time to find the courage all the time like I was 20 years old, to see that everything was a mirage. I hear deep inside me a small muffled and throaty voice that says I'm I am alone in this world. Sanson sings about abandonment, despair, and about ma reverence. These two words, ma reverence, have different meanings that are related to each other. One meaning is my bow, a gesture performed at the end of the dance, end of the ballet, 
Uh, using this word is very interesting, since the image depicts a couple dancing. The second meaning is retiring this world, leaving it in the context of death. The dramatic and sad song adds another layer to the image and charges the dance with melancholy. We see a couple dancing and we hear a song from a first, per, uh, first person point of view, talking about being left alone and retiring from this world. The sound image relationship creates a counterpoint and predicts the solitude, solitude inherent in the contact just after they met and when they feel happy. The song functions as a, gray, as a Greek chorus and the words can throw light on the scene and on the way relationship are depicted in the whole film in a pessimistic way. Loneliness is an in integral part of the state of love and desire. This theme is one of the uh, characteristics of Chantal Ackerman's cinema and it appears in many of her films. Thank you very much and enjoy the film. Thank you. So in, in your introduction, in your presentation, you made a very compelling argument uh, about the film as an, an example of a cinema of the body. And by the way, I think that the use of the clip in the presentation was one of the most effective clips I've seen in a presentation because it provides such a convincing key to to what Ackermann is doing in this film and uh, to the point where you ask yourself, you know, how, when she made this film, was she, to what extent was she already aware? I mean, she must have known the work of, of Pino Bausch and, and how much of an influence is Pino Bausch on, on this film. Um, but I want to start off by highlighting something that I think we could gather from the reaction of the audience as we were watching the film. Um, in my brief remarks, in, in the intro, I used the melodrama as a framework, but you could also, and and exactly, watch this film as a comedy. You know, there's the, there's the slapstick of desire, um, and 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 so there are these abrupt movements, and and it's always bordering on on the comedic, and I mean, obviously the the scene of the woman returning and laying down and then then the alarm clock goes off that's that's a highly comical moment so uh, how in view, your view do melodrama and comedy and tragedy uh, uh, coalesce in this film yes. Yes. I think that um, what interesting about this film as many other Ackerman films that you cannot define them mm. You cannot define them by one sentence or the genre, because it's. Uh, I agree with you. It's part melodrama, it's part comedy, and it's part tragedy. Mm -hmm. And I think she combines. Uh, she combines them. The three of them, maybe maybe also a musical, mm -hmm. and she combines them together. So it's hard to determine what kind of film is it. Is a bright, the bright side of it, the comedy. Um, is it more comedy or is it more, it's more um, melodrama or a tragedy? And I, I, about the Pina Bausch, do you think it's the same? Do you think it's not, it's not the same movement? I wanted to ask you, what do you think about the comparison? Is it the, the same movement or it's because it's different? There are some elements that are um, similar, but some that are totally different. Mm. What what I found compelling about the choice of the clip is that that uh, it, it's uh, one of those moments uh, where um, you know you have it, it, it's sort of mimetic, realistic in in the depiction of a of a relationship dynamic, but it's also highly abstract and and uh, choreographed. You know, it's modern. Yes. It's, it's it's modern dance too. Um, um, and and uh, what I found compelling about a clip in relation to the film is that that it highlighted that these seemingly random events and and very you know everyday occurrences 
are in fact highly choreographed and and um the the selection that she makes as always i mean the editing um uh is is very important in in Ackermann's film the timing of the movements uh, when it starts how long it lasts the rhythm that it has how uh the individual bits relate to each other um uh, i think uh, uh, make the comparison to i, I wouldn't state it a direct analogy or a direct translation, but but uh, it, it's clearly a film that that uh, was made by someone who's been thinking about modern dance a lot. That will be my view. Yes. I think you're right. I think you're right because I, I think also I think it's part of her language mm-hmm. in many of her films. But I think she was also exposed when she was in New York to um, modern dance yeah. or avant-garde dance in the, in, in, the, scanning MF, in the beginning of the 1970s. Um, yes. Even Rainer. Um, regarding the, the different genres, I think it's very interesting but because many laughed, many, many of the audience laughed and it's, I also felt quite different from the way I watched it uh, in my house, in my mm. home, because uh, it was more funny when I saw it on yeah. the big screen, yes. Yeah. Yes. Please, Verena, we have a question from the audience. Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to say, but um, the connection you did with Home Stories from, by Matthias Müller, I liked a lot in so far as... Uh, the emphasis Ackermann put on uh, windows and doors is, is huge. And I mean... Balconies. And back, yeah, balconies, of course. I mean, the, the limiting and opening at the same time of uh, windows and doors. And uh, I mean, th- th- there's almost no shot where, even if the window is not in the... Uh, in, the, in the shot or uh, in the image uh, where you know that there's a, uh, a window. So, yeah, transitory spaces. Mm. And I mean, you you made a, a, a you you mentioned Hopper. Yes, a lot a lot of Hopper's compositions, of course. You know, people at windows and people seen through windows. Uh, so there's yeah. there's also the colors in mind of Hopper, and the lonely uh, women or men sitting alone, and you can see the. Um, the uh, restaurants or bars it's very much like some of the shots uh, hopper but there are, there are many curves squirrels that reminds a little bit um you know uh, Car- not caravaggio a little bit caravaggio yes yeah. it's very low the, the the lighting is very low yeah. Yeah. do we have more, yeah, more questions, questions comments from the audience yes please I want to highlight the moment of isolation. Brussels seems to be a town where you see only <coughs> lovers and cars. That's the only two things which are moving. <laughs> all, the else, all, all other things are <coughs> static. Um, and there's also a moment of archaeology. So this aesthetics of the 1970s, it doesn't exist anymore. We live in a time um, which is overburdened with decoration and I like the simplicity of these interiors um, which she shows and um, <coughs> yeah okay uh, there's another thing um, Brussels was and is also a center of contemporary dance so um, it's very it's very plausible that he, she knows Pina Bausch, but there's also a lot of other things going on in Brussels, and in one of her other things is Stephen Paxton. So there is an influence of contemporary dance and improvisation, I think. I mean, as as Ken uh, was pointing out, the Pino Bausch film was made immediately after this this one, uh, a year later. So she moved from this film uh, to the Pino Bausch film, which uh, she couldn't have done without preparation. Uh, so so she was obviously um, familiar with Pino Bausch at the point she made this. 
something That's interesting. Cool. When you see the, the Vendors film mm. three years ago, because I think Pina Bausch, there were so many films about Pina Bausch, yeah. but Vendors film is one of the most famous. You don't see these interactions. Mm. Because I think in this film, in, the, in her documentary, she emphasizes these collisions yeah. more than other directors who made films about Bausch. Right. She, so she looks at uh, the things she's doing at her movies in Bausch work. Right, exactly. Because you don't see it in the, in the vendors, it's much more, you know, grandiose. Images. Yeah, and, yes. yeah, yeah. Iconic. yeah that's, that's interesting. Just uh, if, if I may add a little uh, note on decoration in Brussels. Um, the Brussels is, of course, also the, let's say, the urban capital of Art Deco. And um, the house, I mean, three of the scenes are shot in the same house. Um, uh, they're like on every floor, uh, there's there's an episode. And um, as you could see from the entrance, it's an Art Deco house. Uh, so the door is probably, you know, it's, it's generic Art Deco, but it's inspired by Victor Horto. Um, so that's a very Brussels element uh, in it, and, and it will be interesting to to think about decoration or lack thereof in 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 this film, also in relation to bodily movements. I don't know. Yeah, we have another question. <clears throat> as we have a uh, specialist tonight uh, as a guest, I want to strengthen the American avant-garde experience, which as you pointed out in your um, speech, in your feature, um, influenced this Chantal Ackerman a lot. I would, as for your um, yes. papers, point. Uh, when I became to know Chantal Ackerman in the early 80s, that was through the Cahiers of Cinema, Cahiers de Cinema. cinema. And as she is a Belgian, French-Belgian, they were very close to her and her works. They was together with, Fou uh, with um, Truffaut, Last Metro. And I've never seen a film of her before. I even though she was an avant-gardist. Before uh, 1980? Yeah. Okay. No, tonight is my first time. Ah, it's your first time tonight. <laughs> yes. Uh, great. <laughs> and um, so this question of avant-garde never appeared to me, because it was, you said also, it was the early 80s. There was a lot, not only in Brussels, but everywhere in the world. There was a, yes. maybe, a war, maybe war between Russia and America. There was, I was in 82, was in Tel Aviv in my first communal cinema in Tel Aviv, saw so Taxi Driver. There was a, a war in Israel too, in 82 and so on. In Israel you have every, every year you every have war. Every year you have war. <laughs> <laughs> so I never really fixed it that this, that this Chantal Ackerman is so avant-gardist. And you, as you pointed it out with uh, Dennis Hopper, can you say something on the influences of American avant-garde to this filmmaker? Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. As I said, um, she moved after her first film, first short film, she moved to uh, the United States and then she was exposed uh, also by, by, by uh, her f cinematographer in uh, Jean Dilman. And also, it's the same cinematographer is in uh, One Day Pinas, Babette Mangul, that will be him. And she was exposed to the um, American avant-garde at the Anthology Film Archives, run by uh, Jonas Mekas. And uh, there she saw the films of uh, Michael Snow. And in every interview she mentions him and his film La Région Centrale, La Région Centrale and Back and Forth. One from 1969, back and forth, and La Région Centrale, 1971. And she speaks about the way the, uh, Michael Snow uses use space. Because in these films, in La Région Centrale, there is no, no person at all. The camera uh, spins 
pens and uh, moves in any kind of direction and films only the landscape for three hours. And in back and forth, you have only the space of a uh, classroom. And uh, in the interview, she's, um, what she's saying is that you can use space, space in such a way to create tension, even empty space. Because the question will be when, um, in back and forth, when, when will you see again one of the, uh, one of the um, uh, people in the class? I think it happens here very interesting because you have many empty frames and then the, the character moves from one side to another and you see an empty space. And sometimes the character comes from another space than the one you expected. So there is a kind of tension. And, and one more thing about avant-garde, it's almost avant-garde, I think. Uh, the reason she started making films was when she was uh, 15, 15 years old, after she saw Pierre Olefou by Jean-Luc Godard. So it's also part of it. Yeah. I just might add that if you grew up in Belgium in the 1960s, you didn't have to travel to New York to see the films of the avant-garde because you think they were, ah, yeah, there was the Festival, the festival of Nanook. 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 Uh, yeah, Nanook. Okay. Okay. Nanook. 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 Okay. yeah. Uh, which is a, a beach, uh, yes. uh, beachfront station, uh, which has a large gallery scene, and they they organized um, a, a, an, an, an experimental film festival, which is where um, uh, Wavelength, Michael Snow's films, was first shown in Europe in 1968, I think, 67, even the year it came out. Okay, uh, remember, please. I have a question. <coughs> I have a question with respect to um, repetition and sound design. This is for both the aspects that you mentioned in the beginning that I also found very convincing, and also the question of the light motif, especially of this um, Italian song. So, um, and I'm, for me, it was very interesting because I saw the film when it came out, um, and then mm -hmm. I um, I went to the cinema uh, in four consecutive evenings. So I saw it. Um, I, I went went straight the next evening and another evening, and it's the first the first time I brought a tape recorder back then, <laughs> and I I just taped. I was completely blown away by the way how she was dealing with this Italian song, and so it was interesting now for me to see it uh, by revisiting this film after the year. It still works uh, with me perfectly. So I was wondering how how she and I think it has something to do with the process of working through this song because it's also it's not just the song. Because you're, you're, you're saying in the, in the beginning it starts with some kind of sound sn snippets or this light motif. So, and then you have this kind of, this very, um, then you have these two dancing scenes, the one of this, uh, uh, with this uh, very young, almost, almost girl, woman uh, in, in this bar with this group. Yes. And then, but in the end, you never hear the song, but you also you hear uh, the way how the people listen to the songs while they are dancing because it's uh, they they're thinking about their partners. So why do you love them? Is it the mouse? No, it's not the mouse. And it's it's in in a way there's some there's something weird going on in these types of repetition because you never hear this really the song, but it's always uh, so it builds up. And I was wondering whether you could say something about so you you mentioned on the one hand the sound of the objects, so so um, the, the noise of the of the shoes of the doors and this is and the noises of Brussels and then you have something um, how the uh, how the sound object itself transforms within the film from the snippets that is part of the cityscape so the song as a is part of the cityscape of Brussels and then when it becomes this almost this uh, psychic thing in the end so and I was wondering what what happens in these three stages with this song of uh, what was his name again? Is it Nino Di um, oh, uh, Gino Lorenzi? Uh, Gino Lorenzi. Yeah. yeah. So I I have to repeat it to myself because I want to buy this record. <laughs> yeah. I'm so, I'm sorry. It's on you YouTube, can buy it uh, on eBay. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a single. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking for it. Yeah. You should buy before I buy. <laughs> <laughs> the race is on. <laughs> um, it's a very interesting and complicated question because when I heard uh, the song for the first time, you hear it very, you hear it in the background. You almost don't hear it. And then you hear it again and uh, you hear it much louder. 
and then you hear it uh, when they dance <coughs> sorry when they dance in a very strange and surreal scene with uh, uh, very, with the child and the, um, and the man and uh, then in the end I was thinking about it also um, I think it's like um, looking from different angles about the same thing or a different variation of a scene of uh, something that happens that, like every time you hear the song in a different scene it sounds different so I think it's part of the repetition and I think the words are important and they never uh, like any other film when you hear a song that is not in English Also, it's in English. When it's in English, you, you understand the words. They don't translate the uh, lyrics. And I think the lyrics here are very important because it is very connected to the, to the film. It, 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 to me, it uh, seemed almost as if the song inhabited the city. Yes. It floats, floats yeah, over. It, yeah. it shows up in places. Or it, 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 you can hear it. But, but it's never clearly attributed. It's like, okay, there it is again, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, yeah, La Leaf, please. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I was really taken by this instant in the, in the film where uh, we see Ackerman's mother. Yeah. Um, well, also because the last film that I saw, well, I then, after she died, I went back to her earlier films, but... The last film that I saw was no home movie um, and um, and um, when I saw her here now in the film i I, um, I was reminded um, of a sentence Ackerman once uh, said about Jean Dilman. She said that she wanted to make a film about women like her mother who were trapped within this kind of like repetitive routine of housework and anticipation um, and I thought that a lot of the um, Um, I mean, well, also the, the scene with uh, Ackerman's mother, she's you know, smoking or maybe waiting for something, and a lot of the women were waiting for something or trapped within this repetition of, you know, uh, being embraced and then being, being thrown away or being... So I was thinking about how she produced, not just in this film, but also sometimes in, in all of her film, this... Um, like, a feminine condition of anticipation, of waiting for something. I was just, I thought that was an interesting reference. Yes, <clears throat> I think you're right, because it's a film also, because it's, it happens in Brussels, it's also a film about uh, her mother, her mother's city, and uh, it, there is no, uh, it's not a coincidence, she appears in the film. I wanted to ask the audience and you, did you hear in the soundtrack, something when you see her mother? Mama, mama. Mama, okay. Um, Perhaps not everybody knew that it was her mother, though. Uh, so, in so she, smoking outside. Yes, yeah. she, she's talking, Chantal calling her from behind the film. Yes, she's like calling her. And I thought about the uh, condition of the, the, um, of the women waiting for the... For the men, but also in this in this film, you can you can also see the men. Men are waiting. Um, very lonely men, like uh, the one who um, cannot sleep. Yeah. Yes. But it isn't. Uh, it is interesting that uh, we see the child um, with the with the kitten just before one scene before we see her mother, like she she's getting out of her house running. It's interesting. And taking the kitten with it with her. <laughs> yes. Well, do we have any more comments, questions, feelings? 
I mean, it just uh, I, I was just thinking as I was listening to your question, Lalif, and and uh, Hen's uh, answer. Um, Song Hui Lim, uh, in an analysis of Ho Xiao Xian's films, in which he uses a comparison to Chantal Ackermann, uh, proposes to speak of gender temporalities, and he describes exactly the kind of repetitive, um, uh, you know, nothing happens kind of temporality. You just wait there, temporality, which uh, <clears throat> he then also describes in, in certain uh, kinds of modern Chinese literature. Uh, Eileen Chang and Chu Tianwen and uh, Ho Xiaoshan. Chu Tianwen is the screenwriter of Ho Xiaoshan, uh, but also a novelist and short story writer. <clears throat> and what's interesting is that um, in this film, like you said, the men also wait. So it, it's sort of that temporality is not gender essentialist, if you will. It, it's a, 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 a sort of an experiential mode that, that apparently. Yes. Uh, you know, is mostly uh, the fate of women, but not just and not only, and and particularly at night. I mean, we shouldn't forget that this is a film that, as the title says, uh, plays at night time. It's also uh, a film noir. It's also a film noir. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so, so it's it's sort of a temporality that's outside of what normally happens. It's it's a night. That is too hot for people to sleep, um, and and so so it's not your usual mode of of organizing your your time and and your actions, and that sort of creates a a level of gender equality. Probably, I don't know what do you what you think, or Lalif. You need a microphone. I can say. Um, I think it's true that they're both waiting, but I think that they each do it in a different way. So the men waiting downstairs cannot sleep is different than the women <coughs> looking outside the window. Um, so actually, y you're right that th they're both waiting, but they're doing it in a very different way. And and I think a lot of the film is about this ritual of, of, of couples, although there are also not only heterosexual couples in it, which is very refreshing. Um, but it's a lot about the ritual of the couple, and in this ritual, each one has a role, like like every ritual, and everybody knows their role, and they can't move out of their roles. So, uh, yeah, I think something interesting happened here because it's not just film about women, um, but I think it's an extremely gendered film. Right. Probably the most interesting male character is the guy waiting downstairs who can't make up his mind, and then in, in the morning he suddenly walks away. But, but, you know, the suggestion is that that's another comical element. You know, you would, you would think he's walking up and down the trottoir for hours oh, yeah. and then he makes up his mind and goes. Whereas she's waiting upstairs for him to come up and and do something, you know. So so there is a, a distribution of roles, as you say. Yeah. I don't know if you feel about this. I felt also. I think it, it, it's in, in between. Also, you cannot define it. And there is also something interesting because uh, I think there is a lot of um, contemplation in this film uh, about the space. And uh, you almost feel plastically the, uh, the space there, the, the walls, the... Right. Yes. And uh, there is a sentence in one of her movies regarding the, the uh, first question in, in a film called uh, A Portrait of a, uh, <clears throat> of a Young Girl in Brussels in the, end of the six, in the end of the 1960s. It's a long name for a film. When, when the girl, with, uh, uh, it's an autobiography, it's like Ackerman says, even when I'm happy, I'm sad. So I, I think it's part of this, mm. the notion of the comedy and the tragedy, right. and drama. She says it's a very important um, uh, sentence. <laughs> Even when I'm happy, I always said. So I think it's a very. Mm. You can think about the film in this way also. Right. A 
it's just one little detail. So you said this film is is not linear storytelling, and I would say yes and no. I think because you have these um, uh, strict three separated time zones, so the, so the evening, the night, and the morning, and you pick up stories, then it's this mix of linear storytelling, simultaneity, and so there is an element of linear storytelling that that's still maintained with this film. So that's also uh, fits to to the argument that you make that you cannot really pin it down. So, so I think this is a way of how to complicate linear storytelling. But I would not say say that the film because it's had such a clear t um, mm -hmm. time frame, I think um, it's something in between. So, But I, I wouldn't entirely give up on the linear storytelling here. There, there are more, there yes. more stories. I understand you, yes. But, you know, one, one story uh, doesn't lead to the, to the other in this way, yes. But it's, it, it's all nice, yes. Yes. I mean, just as we're waiting for the next question, um, it will be interesting to go back to the film and, and time certain scenes. I mean, uh, we spoke about the one narrative arc of the woman leaving her husband and then coming back, but uh, the, the story is really framed by uh, the Aurore Clément character in the beginning who says, I love him. And then somewhere towards the middle of the film, he she receives a visitor and it's the wrong guy. Yeah. And, and in the end, the, she and the wrong guy reappear, and that's basically where it plays out. Um, Ackermann's skill in, as a filmmaker, by the way, shows up in a way she coordinates the color of the dress with the color of the tapestry, um, and it, it, she sort of blends in with the tapestry. Uh, but yeah, we have a question back there. <coughs> I just got an open question. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about the person of the writer, the man who was typing? Just if you like to, it's, it was uh, my curiosity. Who is he? You mean uh, who is the actor? The actor? Um, the person um, who is um, uh, um, acting as a writer or the man yeah. who has, does not have a partner, he was uh, relying on sleeping pills and um, this man. Except what, what I saw in the film, I don't know about. So I, I can see it's like an old, an old uh, work. You can see them, you can see there, but I don't know uh, anything special about him. You know. Um, you mean as an actor as or an actor? Or I don't know. Some of them is probably one of her friends. Whatever, as an open question, because ah. I'm, I'm really hanging on okay. this. Um, uh, okay. I think is the law, is part of the film, of the texture of the film, uh, in the, um, because he's alone there, he's working with um, uh, machines, and we can hear the sound of the machine. Uh, if you remember, at the beginning, he, he types... No, he doesn't type. He, what does he do either? Uh, no, he types there. And uh, after that, we can see him walking through all this. Um, hair salon, like in hair salon. Um, I have to think about it. I think, I mean, there are two lonely male characters. This yes. guy, I mean, he, he uses his calculator, and uh, my reading of the scene is this is somebody who's, uh, whose business fortune has run out. This is the yes. night when he realizes that he has to close his shop, and then he sort of, in a melancholy mood, walks around his shop and lights the match, and you think he's probably going to burn the whole joint down. Um, uh, and you wouldn't be surprised to hear the, the firefighters show up uh, somewhere on the soundtrack. Um, and then and then there's the, the guy who gets up in the morning and, and sits at the typewriter. And those are the two characters who do not have female counterparts. Uh, they're the only ones, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. There is another one, but he goes, he returns to the bed. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I mean, if you go through the cast list, it's a mixture of Akaman's mother, um, uh, friends 
and professional actors. Uh, I mean, Aurore Clément oh, is, is a star of the French cinema of the 70s and 80s, and someone who works very closely and, and in, in uh, several films with Ackermann over a 25-year period. Um, Jackie Cario is in the film, who was sort of a character actor star of French cinema in the 80s. Uh, so it's a mix of professional actors and people from the circle of friends. Yes. Yeah, Danny, please. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a like a weird little question, and you might be able to say something about it, but you might not, so no pressure. But I found them... I just wanted to ask you about your feelings about the end credits, actually, because I found this, the, the, this, the jolt and the soundtrack very striking from that uh, this, this Italian love ballad that Rembert was talking about, very cheesy, repetitive, it kind of gets stuck in your head and you're just going, going round and round and round. Uh, and then you go to the end credits where on the visual level it's black with this like kind of cold blue writing uh and then on the sa the soundtrack is this very eerie yes. haunting yes. uh almost atonal music it's it's kind of between music and noise or something. i mean it's just very uh very eerie uh and a ter like a, a bigger contrast with the previous song could scarcely be imaginable and it, and it really in some ways it kind of for me at least it shifted my whole response to the film like like it made it made the whole film retrospectively darker or something i don't know and is there anything you could say about that yes of course i was um mentioned i mentioned it in the beginning because it's also on the opening credits and uh, i agree with you because in the end i think it's a very dark film and uh, on the first shot, you have the movement between the Italian love song, which is also quite dark, if you listen to the words. But it's more, it's more about longing. And I think the, um, the, uh, music, the title's music is much more dark and threatening and apocalyptic. So it's, it's a kind of apocalypse in, uh, in the... And this kind of music, it's like you said, uh, it's between music and noise. Yeah, I think I think the film oscillates between the the tragic, the uh, the tragic and the apocalyptic nature of uh, relationship, and between the chance that something will happen. And uh, I agree with you that the end the, the end credits and the deep cut between the Italian love song. And the threatening music, almost like in uh, Roman Polanski's film, or in a horror film, or uh, psycho psychological horror film, is very, um, very interesting, and and it's, it's part of the film. The sound here is very important. Yes, the Mahler. Yeah, I didn't talk. It's the death of children, the children death. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I didn't mention it. Just, you know, I wanted to. And the name of the of this piece is uh, the dying children. Yes. Kinder Toten Lieder. And it's I was looking for the um, um, the credits uh, sound, and I didn't find it anywhere. Even in the credits, there is no composer. It's in the credit. Uh, it's in the credits. It's in the credits. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the singer, the singer, and and the, the piano accompanist is listed. Oh. Um, and and the line that, like you, you quoted it, the line that she sings is that I thought you had just left, which is about somebody being in denial about the death of a child, um, and being caught in a in a permanent state of. By Mahler. Yes, in the Mahler yeah. song, the, the the one the one passage that she quotes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, but have another question back there. And it's in 
interesting. I find it's interesting. It is a love movie. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. It's a it's a love movie without continuity editing and without continuous narrative. But there are fragments of narrative. Um, so it's not a movie completely without narrative. Continuous narrative. It's okay. Yeah. And one thing, you never see actually love making, but you see situations, people in situations which could be before love making, it could be after love making, or it could be when love making doesn't materialize. But with very few exceptions, you see people in situations who have love making on their mind. And the question of realism. Um, would people behave like this when other people are around? So in the street, um, in a natural situation, you would see pedestrians. So um, she is leaving this away, she is abstracting it. Or on the stairs, in real situations, you would have neighbors. So the people who are looking for each other and don't find each other, they would be afraid that a door is opening and that a neighbor would be shouting, um, keep silence or something like that. So I would say by abstracting it, by reducing it, by denying continuity editing or a narrative, um, is it possible to characterize this movie as an abstract um, love movie? I think it's very, very, very nice. Uh definition an abstract love movie it sounds good it, uh, in some ways yes it's because it's a you have love movie you have love and it's abstract but there I know I'm not sure that uh, you can say that uh, every relationship there is based on, on on love I'm not sure it's only love it's something that, that uh, you cannot uh, an unfulfilled love or an unfulfilled desire something that you cannot you cannot um, um, understand it or you cannot uh, call it by name you cannot uh, say this is love okay there is a longing for love much more longing for love than love in this film as she says to him in the bed I don't love you anymore So. which is also the problem of the woman who tries to leave her husband and then yes. somehow doesn't manage. Um, and then she wakes up in the morning. Right. <laughs> which proves the automatism of, of love because she enters the bed and then she has the clock and she... Uh, and she's back uh, in her old life, yes. Yes. So calling this an abstract love movie, I think, is a good way of ending the evening. Ken, uh, thank you again so much for the presentation and for the for the generous discussion. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. In. Thank you both uh, very much. Thank you to everybody for staying so long for the talk. And um, like I said, we're repeating the film suit on Saturday in case somebody missed it. And on the 7th of February, we meet again with Patricia White and the film J'ai tout il elle. So I hope to see you all again. Thank you very much. Thank you.